Hi, I'm Will Anderson, and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, a full-service digital agency. If you want to grow with a premium agency and have the ability to work with Jordan directly, then learn more at neural.com slash media and request a callback. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash media. My name is Jordan Michaelides and I'm your host on a show where we dig deep on unique individuals. If you like the show, subscribe. We would love that. It gives us a lot of support and helps us keep things going as well. You can always give us a nice little like, which is always useful. Show notes are down below, just in the comments section. You can also find a link there in the description. It's neural.com slash podcast for all previous episodes. If you want to listen to the audio, if you don't want to be watching it on YouTube, you can find us on all your good podcast apps. That's Uncommon Show. Uh, you'll be able to find us everywhere. If you want to see behind the scenes with us, what we're doing each week, search Uncommon or at Uncommon underscore show uh, on Instagram and you'll find us there. But uh, what can I say? Thank you so much for checking us out and uh, let's get into it. My guest this week is Will Anderson, comedian host of many a podcast, my favourite being uh, Two Guys, One Cup, uh, radio host. Sorry. <laughs> He's just I'm, ju- I'm like- just laughing at you. Did you hear the way you said comedian? comedian. <laughs> it was because we'd spoken about it beforehand. I was and trying I to do said, it. I'm just happy to be referred to as a comedian. <laughs> but then the way you said comedian was kind of threatening, to be honest with you. And I started giggling uncontrollably. I was trying to do it for uh, comedic effect. Mm. But, you know. Well, it had comedic yeah. effect. It certainly made me laugh. And I've uh, ruined your introduction. I'm sorry. No, no, about that's that. a good introduction because the problem with the introduction introductions mm. well one was that they used to be i used to get told off that they were way too long yeah. for a start secondly uh i don't think people really care like what i think about the interview or why i like it i think they just want to hear the fucking interview well i think that they probably do care yeah. and i think that the more that you do this it, it it will be your personality that comes through that differentiates these interviews from you know the interview that i would do in in this situation or the interview that Andrew Denton would do or the interview mm. that you know somebody would do you know a Richard Glo- a Richard Glover would do on ABC radio or <laughs> you know you know they're all going to be different interviews and eventually what differentiates those interviews is the personality and the interest level of the person who's doing the interview. So I think it is important what you think, but no yeah. one wants to hear it up the front. No. Get to the interview yeah. and then you can tell me what you think <laughs> during the interview and towards the end, but let's get to the interview. I was thinking about uh, uh, openers that we can go with and I thought maybe we'll start with like true or false. Okay. Um, so the first one was, uh, and funnily enough, in your little sound test, uh, <laughs> is Adam Hills your long lost brother? Uh, see, the funny thing is that we don't really look that alike. You don't? No. If you put us, if, if we stand next to each other, as he always likes to joke, he's a full foot taller. Uh, oh, sorry, shorter, foot shorter. He is. <laughs> and is he? literally, no, he's literally a foot shorter because oh, he doesn't wow. have a foot. Uh, that, <laughs> that is his joke. He is shorter than me, but he's also a foot shorter. Um, uh, we don't look, you know, particularly like we're related if you see us next to each other. But what we do look like is two white guys who host shows on the ABC, particularly panel shows. And I think that a lot of people just don't pay much attention. And Will sounds like heels. And there's just enough confusion there that people... You know, I get a lot of compliments about Spicks and Specs. And I, I <laughs> oh, once, thanks. <laughs> I once had a driver who um, uh, complimented me about Gruen and my show that came after it, The Last Leg, and he clearly watched both of them, which to me was like, well, did you not notice that I look different, firstly, or that you in had each a of beard? the shows? Yeah, <laughs> that, that I grew a beard in the middle. This was pre-beard, actually, technically. Oh, okay, but, yeah. but also, one of them's clearly filmed in England. Did you think that I was filming a show in Australia every week and then popping over to England to film a show and then back to Australia at the same time? Like, he would watch them in a row and he didn't know that we weren't the same person. I don't know. People people don't... Uh, I find Uber drivers um, an interesting conversation. I love sort of gauging them and the, I ask them the regular questions and seeing whether they're, they're all sort of there or they're just... They just want to get the job done and they don't really give a fuck what you, who you are or, or what you're about or anything like that, which... You know, it's fair enough because most of the time they're driving like 12-hour days. Um, 
But it, but it is funny, and I think what it is is I was thinking about what is it that makes you similar, and it's it's the color palette. So like I've I've started following this Instagram page that's called uh, like something to do with cinematography color palettes, and I feel like if you mapped out the color palette of you two standing together, like the way that you dress, the color of your hair, your skin, everything would be fairly similar. Yeah, I did like when he had the beard because that would differentiate us. Yeah. obviously. Um, the the one the one that I found really funny was. Um, when I got arrested, uh, my girlfriend was in London at the time and she was following it through the, the news reports. And one of the news reports said that uh, uh, an incident had been sparked on the plane because I only had one leg. And I was like, well, firstly, that's Adam Hills. But secondly, <laughs> Hills is not missing the whole leg. <laughs> you know, this is the it's sensational media. <laughs> They've taken off his entire leg Fake news. for the purposes of the story. <laughs> but um, we both joke about it a bit as well. So I think that has made it part of the vernacular as well because we both have these stories that have been mistaken for each other so we've mm -hmm. ended up joking about them a bit and then so it becomes part of the furniture of what people think but it, it's also a great ego check in some ways like yeah you know sometimes people will talk to you about your career and your comedy career and they'll you know, try to talk to you about it in impressive you know tomes like oh you know what's it like to walk down the street and I was like well I you're overestimating, you know, how the popular power. I am. But secondly, even if people do recognise me, they're probably not even recognising me. They're recognising Hilsey. So, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly, my day-to-day -day experience of that is that you can be as big a comedian, you know, in this country, you know, on television, on radio, all those sort of things, and people still don't really know who you are. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I feel like when I was chatting to Tom Ballard, he said the same thing. Mm. People really don't care no <laughs> as much as people think they no. do well because the people who like it really care this is the thing like about the level of you know where my career has been and what has been yeah very rewarding about it is that the people who know you know you normally because of your work mm -hmm. so if somebody sees me and they're excited about it it's normally because they want to come and have a conversation about Gruen or they want right. to come and have a conversation about they remember the glass house or they used to listen to Adam and I on Triple J or they've been to see shows. So they want to talk to you about your work or, hey, I'm listening to your podcast. I get stopped in the street a lot if I'm walking down the street. One of the more common ones I get is someone in a pair of headphones who just stops me to point at their head yeah. to go and listen to your podcast right now. Well, that's fun because that's not somebody really intruding in my life at all. That's somebody essentially just coming up to me going, you made something that I like. Mm. And I'm really pleased about that. That's a lovely level of interaction with the general public. But I'm certainly not one of those people that, I have friends who are famous, famous, you know, and I always classify famous as people know you even if they don't know what you do. Most uh -huh. of the people who know me know me because of some piece of work that I have done that they have hopefully enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are friends of mine, like, you know, like Rove, for example, who everybody knows Rove, but they don't yeah. necessarily know what Rove is up to. Yeah, I wonder what, what that is like for him. Horrible, I imagine. Yeah. Intrusive. Like you, you know, like people, you know, I think at that level of fame, people, you know, just yell at you constantly, you know, as in like, and not even in a bad way necessarily, but, you know, just people are excited and they yell at Rove or they yell out, say hi to your mum for me. And, yeah. you know, I, I imagine it makes your, your life a little bit more difficult just it would going be, about your day to day. It'd be quite exhausting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, next, next true or false question for you. Based on last night's performance, I don't know if you saw it, but um, St Kilda will win the Premiership in 2020. Uh, false, yeah, unfortunately, false. Um, no, I, St Kilda, I reckon, will be pretty good. Yeah, like, they're not going to win it. I think they're going to be pretty good. I think they'd probably a real chance of making the finals. Yeah, that is exciting. Yeah. It was good to see them back at Moorabbin yesterday. I mean, I think technically, I've always been a, you know, Saints back to Seaford guy. You know, that's my, my big dream. Uh, but I <laughs> got to get... I, I, just really, I just really feel for that, you know, the guy who owned the Subway sandwich shop down at Seaford that used to be so popular when the Saints were down there and now has a massive hole in his business. We all care about the bushfire victims, but nobody call, cares about the guy who ran the one shop in Seaford who was really benefiting from the Saints being down oh, there. Oh, fuck. Um, but... I'm, no, I'm like this season, because I, I, obviously we have a podcast, Charlie and I. Charlie is a St Kilda fan and I'm a Bulldogs fan. Mm. And I feel like this might be the first season where we have a real chance of both of our teams going deep into the finals. And it would be amazing to 
do the podcast if both our teams were having like a great deal of success and maybe even like our ultimate dream of course is a two guys one cup cup you know our teams playing each other in the grand final would be amazing I mean it'd be the end of the podcast it would tear us apart but it would be amazing see my family barracks for St Kilda and then my my cousin's family are sort of half St Kilda half Bulldogs I've always had a soft spot for the Bulldogs. We actually had Shane Delian, I think, like two weeks ago. Yeah. He, sh- he was showing off his new um, 2016 tattoo. I quite was, nice. Yeah. Well, I um, was – I th- th- and there's footage of this that exists somewhere, but he and I sat together. I saw at, it. At that grand final. <laughs> and so Charlie was there. I'm yeah, pretty sure Charlie captured it. Charlie filmed it. it. That's right. And it's me – whispering in his ear that uh, we we're about to be the premiers. So it was very exciting. Oh, I mean, I'm still getting a little chill down my spine when I think about that moment. I still, do you know, I actually, I've re-watched that, the final highlights, like, multiple times because it makes me think, like, if the Bulldogs can do it, St Kilda can do it. Yeah, well, particularly if that Bulldogs team could do it because I think, on paper, the team that we have going into this season is a stronger team than we took into 2016. Now, that doesn't mean that it will translate into us you know, winning the grand final. But, yeah, that Bulldog story, I think, I think the the worst thing about that Bulldog story is suddenly every team in the competition was like, <laughs> hey, we can, that could be us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone thinks that all everyone of a sudden, like, oh, we can do it now. <laughs> oh, yeah, just take yeah. it one week, one week at a time. Yeah, we can definitely do it. It's just, yeah. people don't realise there was a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say luck, but, like, you just had a lot of momentum and also the game style that you played was is what Richmond plays now. Yeah. And as well, Richmond we were, has perfected. I think that the, in the history of sport, what can generally happen is that a good tactic mm. can s- steal you the advantage in a moment of time, right? But it's almost the perfect way to do it is be underestimated going into the final. So, Because if you were the number one team playing that style for the entire season, then... You know what happens in sport. Every other team goes to work Everyone going, how do we do it? Yeah. How do we shut it down? How do we adopt something that can counter this? But the Bulldogs had been playing that style all season, but they you know, ended up in seventh spot, so no one really had their entire focus on looking out for the Bulldogs. And then I think because the Bulldogs had that style that was able to tear people apart, yeah. that we had that time to mug them. But by next season, of course... Everybody else has worked like out tactics and played like that. And so everybody else catches up. And that's why a tactical advantage, like, it can only be, it can only work for a minute in this modern day because there are so many coaches and assistant coaches and video replays. And the idea that you can have some secret tactic that your opposition doesn't work out for a sustained period of time just yeah. doesn't work anymore. As long as they've got the footage, they can mm. start mapping it out. Yeah. Um, go- going to your childhood, maybe, what. You grew up on Anderson Road in Denison, milking cows, wanting to tell dick jokes. Uh, how does a guy growing up in Gippsland go for the Bulldogs? Like, I, I would have thought there'd be another team that, like, as my grandmother's side of the family uh, all grew up in Gippsland, Foster was their area, uh, around the Foster paper mm. back then. Um, but the team was not the Bulldogs in that part of the world it was like the hawks and st kilda and stuff like that so east gippsland's a bulldogs feeder zone technically but that isn't the reason well i guess technically it's partly the reason that i barrack for the bulldogs i was born into uh my grandfather is a massive collingwood supporter and then the 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 team the kids were all uh collingwood supporters uh and then all the grandkids were collingwood supporters apart from my dad who went out on his own and became a geelong supporter And so when it came to us deciding our teams, his attitude was, I I I chose my own team, you should get to choose your own team as well. Uh And so I, like, you know, because I was the eldest kid and every other kid in our family barrack for Collingwood, before I'd really chosen, you know, I was being told I was a Collingwood, you know, supporter, you know, had the Collingwood jumper, granddad was, you know, telling me that I definitely barrack for Collingwood in that way that, you know, parents and grandparents can be around football. And then I had this friend called Jason McCainch, uh, at, who I ran into on Grand Final Day in 2016, and I can't remember exactly, but it was a coincidence. It was a a I didn't like Collingwood. I knew, knew I wasn't a Collingwood fan. I'd been forced into you know 
like it was like you know being raised in a religion where you're like this is not for me you know i need to go out on my own i need it's to have a bit some, north korea yeah I, I need to yeah this i knew i didn't want to be collywood yeah and i knew i wanted to be something else and i had this you know friend who barracked for the bulldogs um but then uh, that and the fact that we were a bulldogs feeder zone because in the old days the the VFL used to have, you know, country zones that if the, kid, the good kids from yeah. that zone would, you know, first go to those clubs. Um, it meant that the players who came down to do school, you know, uh, handball drills and, you know, meet the players, that sort of stuff, were Bulldogs uh, players. Okay. And so I just remember us having a whole bunch of Bulldogs players at the school and me going, no, nah, I'm a Bulldogs fan, you know. So there was a few different things that led to it. But my brother's an Essendon fan and my sister goes for St Kilda. So, like, wow. our whole family have different different Jesus. football teams. How did you yeah. guys ever get to... You must have only gotten to the football maybe twice a year together, if at all. Oh, no, we were just all... See, this, I think this is why I also have... I like I love the Bulldogs, but I love football more than I love the Bulldogs. Like, okay. I, I need to... Like, that is my act- truth. I know you're not meant to say that. You're meant to love your club more than you love the sport. But I love the sport more than I love my club. Wow. I love the club as well, but I don't see football through the prism of the Bulldogs. I love watching AFL football. And sometimes in a season, I'll watch more live games of other teams than I will of the Bulldogs because I actually sometimes don't like watching the Bulldogs play live. It makes me nervous, you know, because I want them to, <laughs> to do well. I'd rather know what the result is and then I can sit down and watch the game. But, but I just like the game itself. Yeah, and and my enjoyment of the game actually often isn't really dependent on how the bulldogs are going or not, and I think this came from us all going to other games. You know, the, my favourite games of my childhood, all the best memories I have of going to the footy, none of them are bulldogs games. Mm. A lot of my worst memories of going to the footy are bulldogs games. You know, standing on the yeah you know, wing at the Western Oval, Witten Oval now, but you know in the. Oh, yeah, standing on the concrete in the, the, concrete, in, the yeah. in the rain when the Bulldogs didn't get a goal until the third quarter sort of thing. You know, that that's my Bulldogs memories. But, you know, I have memories of going to, yeah, watch Hawthorne play regularly with my mate Mark Howard. And, um, you know, I went to the 1989 grand final and watched, you know, that was my first grand final I ever went to. Loved it. You know, had much more fun at 89 watching Geelong and Hawthorne play than I had in 2016. 2016, I didn't breathe for two and a half hours, you know, like... <laughs> It wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah. It was fun afterwards when we won, but it wasn't like a pleasant experience. But 89, I love because I've got no dog in the fight. I can just see, you know, this powerhouse Hawthorne team take on, you know, Gary Ablett, basically, yeah. which is what happened on that day, and enjoy all of it. It's really interesting because I I remember, um, yeah, everything for me was just St Kilda, St Kilda, St Kilda. I didn't have anything else. Um, and it did, I, I remember Waverley Park was uh, just an absolute fucking shithole. I remember I was quite young in 97 when they lost and walking back to the car, just crying the whole way. Um, and for years, I actually stopped watching the football. I, that was when I got into soccer. Right. I played soccer for like 10 years. Um, and I only really got back into football when I was like 16. I wonder how much of like being forced to just go watch the Saints every week and, you know, you just like, I, I remember one game last year had, uh, you know, like a good old Fitbit on and my heart rate was like 115, just sitting. Like that's not, that, that is not healthy. <laughs> I mean, it's not particularly healthy, no. <laughs> no, like it, it should not be resting at that at a game of football. That just shows how much anxiety it gives me. But I also love it because... There is no other time that I can have with my family uh, and not think about work or anything else and just be shooting the shit. Well, that is, uh, I will say, the fact that we don't bury for the same team is probably, um, you know, you don't have that incredible bond, Mm. you know, of being there. And, you know, but I've sat next to my dad at, you know, I've been lucky enough to take him to, Geelong premierships, you know, to you know, to be able to get him a ticket to go to the grand final and us go together, and I very much enjoyed that. But yes, I guess it would have been a different bond if that had yeah. been Dad and I sitting there, you know, barracking for the same team, you know, in that moment. But I like, I think in general, I like that I was raised to love the game more than the club because I think that that has kept me loving the game through periods of time when the Bulldogs haven't been a particularly great team. Yeah. 
if you speaking of your dad, if you think about your own childhood, um, I know that you realised like milking cows wasn't your thing before going to school. But I guess I was curious. You know, you've spoken a lot about this whole stubbornness that comes from sort of that uh, dairy farmer mindset. You know, like oh, she'll be right um, type mindset. But are there particular lessons or principles that you have from your parents that you still use today? Uh, well, certainly just persistence. Mm. You know, that's, you know, probably stubbornness is like, you know, it, stubbornness is certainly part of it and she'll be right is certainly part of it. But I think more than anything, it's about the fact that life goes on regardless. You know, yeah. you, like the, you, whatever happened today, you, the cows still need to be milked in the morning. That's what farming is, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you might have had a shocking day today but the cows need to be milked in the morning and they need to be milked again in the afternoon. And you need to, you know, there are certain things that just need to be done, you know, whether there's a drought, whether there's a flood, regardless of your own personal circumstances, they need to be be done. done. And that attitude has served me well in, you know, in other jobs where, you know, people perhaps don't have that attitude or it isn't an attitude that you're raised with, you know. Yeah. Um, the idea of things, you know, sometimes when things are overwhelming in other industries, people stop doing them. Whereas I, I think probably the greatest, you know, thing that has led to whatever success that I've had is that I've just not let failure stop me mm. because I've done plenty of shit stuff. Um, you know, a lot of the time when I was trying to do something good and it, didn't come out well, or, you know, you thought you did something that would be amazing, but people didn't like it, or, you know, through tough per- personal circumstances, you just have to go in and, and be funny. I don't need ideal circumstances to be funny. You know, there would be some people who'd be like, I want to have a rest for three hours today, and I need to make sure I've had eight hours sleep, and I need to, <laughs> you know, be treated in this way. I need to have, like, you know, had an apple 45 minutes before I go on stage or whatever. I, I, I do comedy, and I like some of those things as well. And in an ideal circumstance, I would arrange my day in a way. But really, uh, you know, I can comedy in the same way as you, you need to farm, which is if I'm tired, I can still comedy. And if I'm, you know, well rested, I can still comedy and I can do it late at night or earlier in the morning or the middle of the day or whatever it needs to be done. Like I treat it a lot more. I think that attitude of, you know, just keep doing stuff, you yeah. know, you just got to keep doing stuff. Well, it sounds like it just makes you comfortable with discomfort, if that makes sense. Like as in... Here's an example. Some of the industries I used to, well, my dad, he's a printer. He's like a third generation commercial printer. You have no choice but to run the machines all day long because otherwise you'll just basically, you either go broke or um, you have someone bearing down on you saying that their book's not done or this isn't done or whatever. It's just, you can't not show up. Even if you've got fucking, what did he have one time, like encephalitis or some shit oh, like that? Okay. Well, it's, so that is actually the sort of thing you shouldn't get away <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah, you should not be doing that. Uh, <laughs> um, hospitality was one. I worked yeah. in hospitality for years. You just can't not rock up because the place doesn't open and then it's just – it's more it, – what it is, it's more embarrassing not rocking up or no, more painful not rocking up and doing the thing than sort of diving out of it, if that makes sense, or jumping well, out of also, it. Also, just part of it's showing up. You yeah. know, when I got arrested on the way to Wagga Wagga, one of the, you know, it's so, so funny to say it, but really one of the things that was really worrying me was that I was going to miss my show that night because I, <laughs> yeah. I don't miss shows. You know, I can't always guarantee you the show's going to be great, you know, because sometimes for other reasons it's not. But I'm going to rock up. Have I'm you... going to be there. You know, I'm going to turn up to work and, and try my best. Have you ever missed a show? Uh I, I have. I missed the show in, uh, um, never missed the full show. Never okay. had to, you know, like uh, miss a full show or, or cancel a show in that way. But I have um, oh, about 23, 24 years ago, um, I was doing Melbourne Fringe. Okay. And um, I got really, really sick, like so horribly sick that I just literally couldn't couldn't you know they were they were just like you you can't do your shows you like you have to like and in retrospect absolutely appropriate too because a i was really sick but secondly um yeah it was contagious 
So it would have been really, wow. <laughs> it would have been really horrible of me to go. These people need to laugh so much that they might contract a disease <laughs> from coming to my show. You know? Added bonus. Seen the show, get the cough. You know, <laughs> but um, and the only other time is in in Canada a couple of years ago at the Montreal Festival. I missed a late night show because I got stuck with bad directions. Somebody sent me to like you know. So I was, it was one of those nights where I was just a guest on a. A show. It wasn't like a big deal show, but it was like I was a guest on a show, and someone sent me to the wrong venue, and so I just missed it on, on time. But it was incredibly frustrating to me. In fact, it was at the end of about four or five shows that night, and I remember crying. Like I was, you know, just walking through a big crowd of people, just yeah, you because know, you're so tired and just. Yeah. And I was so disappointed to miss the show. It was a show that I was looking forward to for a start, and and but also, I just don't. To me, there is a bit of a. You know, pride in going, well, at least I, I try to get there on time and I try to rock up and I try to do a good job. So missing a show, even like a small show like that, and even a show where they were absolutely fine to cover for me. I didn't leave them in a tough situation. Everything was fine for them, but I still just felt, you know, um, and, and, you know, I was incredibly tired at the same time, but it was yeah. a combination of all those things. And I remember walking through these crowds of French people speaking people trying to get to the right venue and just having a little cry do you um are you the type of guy that uh gets very not anxious before flying but you want to be there like three four hours beforehand oh uh, i i prefer not to be late I, what i've noticed in my life is that most of my situational anxiety comes from lack of time yeah so you know today like like i would much rather arrive somewhere early then feel like I'm going to be late, you know? That minute you're in a car, so I got, you know, I, for today, I yeah, got here 15 minutes early. If I get here 15 minutes early, it means that, oh, look, there's a cafe, I'll go and grab a cup of coffee, you know, I'm relaxed, I'm, I'm here on time. If I get in that car and, you know, suddenly, and I'm sure if I'd been here at 11.05, it wouldn't have really mattered to you. No. But to me, that entire car ride, I would have got increasingly like, yeah. anxious about the fact that, oh, now we're stuck in traffic or now we're, you know, doing this. And I, so what I realized was that going early takes a lot of the stress and anxiety out of my life. Mm -hmm. But then what I've added to that is I go early and then if something really does go wrong, I don't worry about it at all because I've done everything that I could have possibly done to make sure that I was there on time. I didn't, you know, leave it to the last moment. Yeah. So then I'm actually able to relax. You know, so say for example, I'd left... 15 minutes earlier for this today, we get stuck in a massive road accident that nobody knew was there. I won't I won't worry anymore. Mm. I'll just sit there and go, well, there's nothing I could do about this. Maybe, you know, send you a message to say I was going like, you know, normal human stuff. And it's taken a huge amount of anxiety out of my my life. I don't like to be rushed or get the feeling that I need to rush from one place to the other. That That is something that used to give me a lot of mm. tension. And that's probably, you know, that Montreal example that I told you about, there was a sense of that I'd been rushing from one place to the other and then when I got to the wrong place and realised I wasn't going to get to the right place on time, you know, it all all bubbled out at once. I'm realising as you're saying this, is this is something that I need to do. Mm. It's incredible. I will, tell, I will say to people, if you like, it's changed my life. Just planning to get everything 15 minutes earlier. Because also, if you do get there 15 minutes earlier, or sometimes, you know, it goes even quicker than you're 20 minutes earlier, what's the worst thing that can happen? You read the newspaper or you go for a little bit of a walk or you get a coffee or you... Yeah. Like, you know, if anything, it always tends to add something good to your day. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right? It's not a bad thing that you got there 20 minutes early. You went and had a, you know, you went and had a freon down the street. <laughs> you're feeling much better when you get to the interview. You need to have this conversation with my dad. Because uh, he's a he's a fan of yours and your shows, and uh, he it, it is a trait that I picked up from him, and it does it it just adds massive anxiety. Like, yeah, it's not a good it's really not a good habit. Yeah, and well, I think part of it probably comes from the fact that you know a lot of my job does involve being there on time. Mm. You know, like breakfast radio. If you're not there, you know, when they turn the microphone on. It's not like you can go, I'll be half an hour late today, like some other jobs, you know, yeah. and stand-up comedy particularly. So, you know, if my show's meant to start at 7 o'clock and I'm not there, <laughs> they can't start the show. So I guess, you know, specifically you have to be reasonably good with time anyway. But I noticed that most of the bad decisions I would make in my life, most of the time where I would, you know, my brain would start to work irrationally, 
would be when I when I was under time pressure. Yeah. I want to jump back to uh, Will before he was on time, so young Will. Yeah. Uh, we know the story of you getting this scholarship. You found the arts and drama. It's, it was a Sale Grammar or Gippsland Grammar? Gippsland Grammar. Well, uh, St Anne's and Gippsland Grammar School is the official name of it. Uh-huh. Stags. Stags. Mm, it's okay. a nice acronym that they would have on the back of their uh, <laughs> sports clothes. Stags. <laughs> Um, St Anne's was the old girls' school down there and then Gippsland Grammar was the boys' school, but it was co-educational by the time that I went through it. So, uh, yeah, St Anne's and Gippsland Grammar School went to, got a scholarship. So yeah. I went there in gr- grade six from Hayfield Primary and then, um, yeah, and then completed my high school education there as well. So. Did journalism at University of Canberra. Yeah. You did, um, I don't know if it was a cadetship, but you worked... Uh, at the Parliamentary Press Gallery, I found that you worked at the Fin Review. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, I've told this story a million times, but um, I don't really know all the details of it. That's the funny thing about it is that, like, I, when I tell this story, my vague recollections of what went on may or may not be 100% accurate because I only have vague recollections. But to my best memory, I believe that there was a program whereby um, each year, in conjunction with the journalism course, right? Uh, right. So where each year, like a top graduate or one of the top graduates, or maybe, see, these are the bits I can't remember, whether there was a bunch of us who got interviews or whether it was just one person who got selected or whatever it was. But basically, in the Canberra Press Gallery, each year they would take one of the top or the top student from the first year and they would then give them, yes, an internship, I guess, would be the best way of putting it, you know, with the newspaper. So Emma McDonald, who's still a really brilliant journalist uh, today, she had done it the year before. She was a year above me. Okay. And she had had hers at the Sydney Morning Herald office at the Canberra Press Gallery Bureau. And then the next year, my understanding is, again, I don't know all the details of this, but my understanding is it would get passed around to different, so like each year it would oh, be a different yeah. organisation within the press gallery so that really for a media organisation your responsibility was only once every four or five years or whatever it might have been. I don't know how many, but anyway, the year that I did it, it was the financial route. Okay. That's why they were, and so that's why I ended up there. So I don't know if it, they just chose me or whether there was interviews of other people, but in the end, yes, I got this position. And so for the next two years while I was studying uh, you know, my journalism course, I was also working, you know, part-time slash full-time, like doing, you know, really a lot of hours, lot of hours um, in sort of a intern cadet um, role at the Canberra Pes- Press Gallery for the Financial Review. And it was an incredible role because it was a real office everything role. So there was probably about six or seven journalists who were based full-time for the Fin Review, you know, political writers, economic writers, you know, out of that Canberra Bureau, and that was their top people, you know. Yeah. And the press gallery there, it's just a series of, you know, so it, to it describe it to people, you know, there's just basically a door to an office that opens, and that'd be the financial review office, and then you go to the next door and you open that door, and that's the Sydney Morning Herald office, right. and then you go to the next door and you open that, and that's the Australian office. And, and so there's a press all, conference room yeah. down the hall that yeah. all the and, ministers will go to. And in all the, in, and this is all in Parliament House, you know, right. so you're actually working in Parliament House, so I would work inside Parliament House. You would, uh, Adam Harvey and I, Adam, uh, who's now a brilliant ABC journalist, Adam Harvey, and he's Peter Harvey, uh, his son, people, people would know the famous Peter Harvey Canberra, uh-huh. and and Adam and I, you know, would walk the, you'd have to go around and collect, yeah, because this was back in the days before everything was email and stuff. So you'd, you know, get these daily Hansard, you know, notes and you would walk around the building, you would pick them up from different politicians' office. There would be all these, uh, you know, boxes that the press releases would get put in. So essentially, you know, part of the job was just to walk down the corridor and go to our little thing and see that there was a, and, you know, so then I would have to go back to the office and go, oh, this was a, this one's from the, you know, the, um, the treasurer, so this needs to go to, on the desk of our you know, economics writer. This one's about you know you know public infrastructure. So so and so will need to know about this. Um, there was a lot of being the internet before internet. So basically getting all the newspapers and then cutting out the articles and photocopying the articles so that if one of the journalists needed to write a story about um, the sports rorts, they would be able to go to the file that had 
all the stories yeah. about the sports rorts so that they could then go back and, you know, I mean, this is, you know, just as, you know, this in the next five to ten years, this would all become electronic and online. But back then, this was, you know, how it was all done. So that was my job, as well as keeping the cab charges, organising Thursday night drinks. Um, and then the biggest thing of all was, occasionally, if there was a story, like a little story that they, you know, no one else had time to do, that's where it would start. So, for example, one night there was a really big Cam- Canberra story, so a national politics story, that's what they would call it, a Canberra story. Um, and so all the journalists were on it, you know, so maybe a leadership spill or, a, you know, a big, you know, scandal or whatever. So everybody's writing on this one thing. Mm. Happened to be the same night as the ACT budget and there was no one in the office to write the AC- ACT budget story, right? Quite a minor story, the you know, the actual ACT's budget in the grand scheme of Australia, you know. Yeah. And so I would do that. So, you know, my job would really be, you know, give us 450 to, you know, 600 words from, you know, the government saying, you know, why this is all great and what their budget's about and then talk to the opposition and give us, you know, a bit on why they think it's a terrible thing and that would be your story. And so you started out doing things like that but then eventually... You know, there would be journalists who needed help if they were working on a big story. So, you know, you ended up becoming like an assistant basically to do extra research, you know, go to, if there was a big story that we covered that ended up being the first page one that I ever had, which was about um, uh, Bob Hawke and he was involved in this betting thing called Vitab, I think it was called anyway, it was an offshore betting thing and Bob Hawke had an involvement and there was a series of hearings and it was being led by a, senior journalists at the Financial Review, but I was the second on the byline, you know, so I would be adding copy, I would be going and sitting in these hearings because, you know, this senior journalist wouldn't want to sit in the hearing necessarily all day long and that, you know, so, yeah. so it was an incredible role. Like, I mean, you got to learn essentially everything about what was going on in a, a Canberra press bureau and in the press gallery in general. And because you're also a kid, no one really pays that much attention to you. And because our role was, yeah, these kids, who, each of us, you know, we had our own little club, you know, all the you know, journo <laughs> people who, we all became friends yeah. because we were all, you know, doing the same thing. And people would just let you go wherever you wanted because you had passes to go wherever you wanted, but you also weren't L- Laurie Oakes or Michelle Grattan or someone that people were worried about having walked through, you know, offices and stuff. So yeah. it, you had incredible access to to Parliament House and to journalism and, 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 and to learn and listen to, you know, what it was all about and what was going on, you know, covered, yeah, Canberra budget lockups and all these sort of things, you know, it was, it was a, a pretty incredible experience. And the financial review sounds like, yeah, it sounds like the financial review, right? But I was in the Canberra press gallery. So it's mostly their politics story still, which was my area of interest anyway. Do you, do you find that that period impacted or heavily impacted your own political leanings or thoughts at all? Like, you know, we all have that sort of age. I, I noticed this with my sister at the moment. I, I would have had that too. It's sort of like 21, 22, you're, you, you're sort of permanently out of home and you're, you're mixing with people at uni. Um, your perception on things goes out of the format of what your parents tell you or what you read in the Herald Sun or what, you know, whatever they're reading. So I, I guess I'm curious, did that, that was the main thing I was curious on, is did that really change your perception? Um, yeah, well, my parents, I imagine, we don't talk about voting, but I imagine from everything that I've picked up from being around them, they probably have both voted national for, you know, they're dairy farmers. Mm. So they vote national. That's what dairy farmers do. They vote national. Now, in the current political climate, that you'd want, if you're a dairy farmer, there'd be a lot of conversation around whether the National Party is in any way serving, you know, farmers. They serve big corporations and they serve multinational interests, but I don't think they do a lot to, you know, in fact, I think they do a lot that's very destructive to farmers now because farmers are on the front line of climate change and they see it happening all the time. You know, they can't plant their crops at the right time. It, you know, they have drought and rain and they have to deal with all these conditions on a daily basis. and. The National Party, you know, does not seem to be interested in, you know, dealing with small farmers. Their mining interests and big 
conglomerates and they seem to be in the pocket of those and they don't genuinely represent you know the country at all anymore but um but certainly i was raised you know around national party mps you know it was not unusual to see you know peter mcgoran or you know these local members who were had been you know the local you know liberal national members f forever at our house for meetings and all these sort of things and i remember peter mcgoran when i was considering um, you know, uh, my I, my interest had you know peaked in sort of you know show business, and him you know giving you know me advice to say that well I should do a law degree first and then I could see what happened after that. That was his you know sort of advice and really yeah. And luckily I didn't get the marks to do a law degree. So. Do you think you would have been good at law? Uh no. You don't think you're persuasive? Oh no no I'm certainly persuasive, but that, I don't think that's the only thing that makes you a good lawyer. That would be, right. I would be good at that bit of it. But no, I'm not like a, you know, I, that incredibly boring research part of being a lawyer. It's not and your thing. It's not my thing. And I also just like arguing things. I think that good lawyers and good journalists, you know, to a certain extent, enjoy arguing points that aren't even what they believe or, you know, you know, contrary to what they believe. You know, they like the idea of constructing an argument and winning an argument, even if it's not what they believe. Um, whereas I've always enjoyed doing, talking about things and doing things and exploring things that I believe, because I think there's enough gray area in what I believe, let alone, you know, in things that are completely opposite to what I believe. And that was one of, one of my great frustrations with journalism was this idea of, you know, this false balance you know, pantomime. So when you say, did it affect my politics? It probably affected my politics in an incredibly cynical way, which was I yeah. lost I lost faith in both living it and seeing it up close. I had a complete loss of faith in both uh, politicians. Most of them are idiots and most of them are not in it for the right reasons. Like people will tell you all the time, well, people get into it for the right reasons. They're all in it for the right reasons. No, mm -hmm. that is absolutely not true. Uh, most, no, maybe most is too far. There are some who have good intentions, but... A um, majority. The system is set up so that politicians are now a lot of people who are in it for their own self-interest mm. and uh, the system itself rewards self-interest and it is a cynical dance between journalists and politicians and the entire thing is a pantomime and it made me incredibly frustrated that both the politicians and the people who are meant to be... Uh, keeping the politicians accountable, that there was such a system set up that did not reward what those jobs were meant to be doing. Mm. And there were great... Po I met great journalists who would constantly, on a day-to-day -day basis, be struggling against... You know, I remember Tom Burton, who was a real hero of mine, brilliant journalist, and the guy who told me ended up... Well, I had a big discussion with him when, you know, I was finished my degree and I'd graduated first in my degree and I'd you know, had two years of experience in the... Canberra Press Gallery. So I had a bunch of you know, job offers and I was considering what to do and I, I didn't want to do it. And I had a conversation with him and he said, I said, you know, I know that I'm good at this, but I don't, I don't love it. And he says, well, go and, go, and, go and find something you love to do, you know? And he was a great, you know, mentor to me. But one of the things he taught me early on was about the drip. And he was, he was, he'd not agreed to the drip. Now, Paul, yeah, Keating had this thing called the drip, which was, you know, if you look after me in your stories, I'll drip you enough exclusives that, you know, there's a kind of reward uh -huh. in this. But if you if you don't look after me, guess what we're going to do? Turn off the drip and all your competitors will get the, le the good stories and you'll get nothing from me. Now, when you're a principal journalist in that situation, like Tom was, he was like, I'm not going on the drip. But of course, that then just meant that, you know, his bosses would see his competitors get more exclusive stories than him or he would have to work you know, 10 times as hard to get those same stories as somebody would who was on the drip. But so I saw, you know, how much that even good principled people who wanted to, you know, that the system was set up not to reward that. The system is set up to reward them all working together. And if you shake my hand, I'll shake yours. And, you know, we, yes, we occasionally knife each other, but then we'll get together at this parliamentary ball and we'll all dance together and sing together and tell jokes together because we're all part of this giant corrupt industry together even if even if the players within it don't feel like they are you know what I kept getting out of it what my eternal frustration about it was was the 
complete and utter pantomime nation, notion of it and the fact that they were much interested, much more interested in the games they were playing with each other than they were with representing the people, which was meant to be what politics and journalism were both about, in my opinion. So, yeah, it certainly changed my perspective on on politics and 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 on mainstream parties in particular. And, uh, yeah, it's why I always laugh when people are like, occasionally, like, yeah, because you work for the ABC or whatever, or because I offer some of my opinions on things, people accuse me of, like, voting Labor. They'll be like, oh, we just say what Labor would say. I was like, mate you don't understand the level of loathing I have for organised politics. Yeah. You know, I could never vote for either of the big political parties because I don't believe them. In fact, I think that if we were ever to truly have a great, you know, political system, because I think we are a great country let down by terrible politicians, terrible leaders. Like, mm -hmm. the opportunity we have in this country and the way that it is continually squandered by the leaders that we have in this country is a historical disgrace and we will look back at this period of time where we had unlimited wealth and we didn't transition it in any way because we were so poorly served by leaders in this country mm. and you know and so for me that's my attitude to politics like and that is in, entirely I went from being somebody who was entranced by the power of politics and journalism like literally that's why I ended up doing it was like I was like this is what I'm going to do you know, the fourth estate, keeping the bastards honest, you know, politics is the way that we, you know, change the country to somebody who is just so deeply frustrated and cynical about it. And that was 20, 25 years ago. It's only much worse now than it was back then. So, it, yeah, it, it's a, that's a good question because I don't think I've ever, you know, answered it in that depth, but that is 100% the, where my attitude to politics come from. Yeah. Because I was thinking, like, you know, I was looking at this, these notes around how you went from that to that. It's interesting that um, Tom Burton was the guy, that boss that you quote regularly in interviews that, that gave you that push. Because from there you sort of, you went to go find yourself, as they say. You went back to Melbourne. Uh, you were watching, or watching at least shows with Judith Lucy and Greg Fleet regularly. And Greg Fleet is your guy, and I'm, I'm a big fan of of Greg Fleet, you started doing a few... Fleety, Judith, Anthony Morgan, Sue Ann Post, Linda Gibson. Lena and Woodley? Yeah, but, uh, but Lena and Woodley I loved, but they were... But I, when I'm talking about people who are more... Because I'm a solo stand-up, you tend to suck up solo stand-ups. Yeah. You know, that was what I was doing. I was less interested in what, like, you know... I loved the Doug Anthony All-Stars, but I never imagined myself being in a Doug Anthony All-Stars style group. Clearly what appealed to me was, you know, Billy Connolly was, but that's where I first saw it. That was the thing that I loved. You know, Billy Connolly, Ben Elton, you know, Richard Pryor, you know, these tapes that you would have. But when I first moved back to Melbourne and I was working in a job that I hated, but I needed to pay some bills and I hadn't quite got the courage to start comedy yet, but clearly, I mean, if you look at the pattern from the outside of what I was doing, I was working this shitty job and then spending every moment that I, yeah, you know, um, had outside work going to watch live comedy. Yeah. Now, no one's that big a fan of live comedy. No. That's clearly somebody who is just trying to work out how they can get involved in this thing. And at the time, you know, you go to the cheese shop or the ESPY and you know, clubs like this and just see, you know, Gibbo and Anthony and Fleety I think just as a young man, they were young, younger men, you know, that, and they just seemed to have this, you know, abandon in the way that they express themselves on stage, you know, this imagination and, you know, Morgs probably in particular could just do things on stage like I'd never seen before. It, Fleety seemed a bit more, I mean, it, Fleety was... This was the peak of Fleety, you know, at his at his greatest genius. You know, where this is the period of time where he's like, you know, two or three years later, going to do, you know, tie dye and yeah, that series of shows. You know, ten years in a long sleeve shirt. He had a series of shows. You know, period of time where he was probably, you know, the best that Fleety has ever been. You know, that was his great moment. And in some ways, tie dye really redefined what solo stand up shows were to a great. You know, what what people see as. Nanette probably never would have happened without tie-dye, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but for me, 
in the sense of the one that you really wanted to be but just thought you could never be because of the the level of genius that he was at was was Morgs, Anthony Morgan. Because I used to say, and I, I've kind of stopped saying it because I it, it sounded, I think it sounded meaner than it was ever my intention for it to sound. Because I used to say five of the ten best gigs I've ever seen are Anthony Morgan gigs, and about eight of the ten worst I've ever seen are Anthony Morgan gigs. And that is not true because the worst Anthony Morgan gig you would ever see is still probably you know in the top hundred gigs you'll ever see. You know. But the only the reason I would say like that was what was so great about Anthony was the thing that made it brilliant was also the fact that occasionally he he would always try to make it brilliant. And mm. if you're always trying to make it brilliant, then sometimes you're risking the idea that it will also crash and burn spectacularly. Like it's a and, fine line, and it's something that I think that I admired so much because I did not have the courage to do that. I always had a safety zone in which I would minimise how bad a gig could go by having some safety around material and topics and ideas and the way that I approached them. But of course that safety net also meant that there was a like a ceiling on how brilliant something could be. And what I admired so much about Anthony, but what also I guess what scared me so much, and it took me personally, and maybe I'm only still getting there now, but I think when I do my improvised shows what I'm really trying to do is capture some of that sense of what Anthony would do in saying I am open to the idea that this could be terrible mm. in the hope that it could be brilliant yeah and it's taken me 25 years of doing comedy probably to now get at the point where I think I am open to that and I think that's what I always found so inspiring but also super intimidating about Anthony. Well, I want to get into that and the sort of how you define the craft of comedy, but I've got to ask quickly. Uh, we spoke about all these different comedians. If you could create the Franken comedian, mm. um, who would you combine? What features? What would they look like yeah. to create this mythical comedian? Well, firstly, I think that the experiment would be flawed, would be my gut instinct, because I think by taking the best of everybody and then combining yeah. them, you would not... That's not the point. The point is that all of these things make up these people and why they're great. You know, these com great comedians are the sum of everything that it is about them. So if you just took one thing about them, you know, if you gave... Billy Connolly, the um, the capacity to do impressions as well as Dana Carvey does, it doesn't necessarily make either of them better comedians, you know? Like, you know, if you take Billy Connolly's storytelling ability and combine it with Dana Carvey's impressions and combine it with Sarah Silverman's dark one-liners or Louis C.K.'s, you know, world perspective or, you know, Anthony Morgan's, you know, brave giant wrists or, you know, Judith Lucy's, um, you know, sardonic persona. If you combine all those things together, what you get is that's like just going, you know, for my birthday, I want a meal made out of all my favorite <laughs> ingredients combined. But it doesn't actually mean that yeah. that is going to be a delicious meal. Yeah. You know? You've ever watched Rick and Morty? Yeah. D there's an episode where they get into a, an alternate universe. Um, Starts with B, I can't remember the name of it, but like all the people are just like this mishmash of things and it's just like this really ugly world, basically. Yeah. Well, that's um, what I think with comedy, you know, like often I think, you know, what you do is defined a lot of the time by what you can't do. Yeah. Like I can't do like one-liner one-liners. I'm bad at replicating. Um, you know, I, you know, as in like, yeah, there are some comedians who are so... Like, I mean, I'll give you a good example. Like, I would love the capacity to replicate something like Celia Piccola can. Like, I watch Celia and she could... You go, this is how I'm going to tell the joke. And then she will be able to perfectly be in that moment, that emotion. Like, she is an act. She's a good actor as well, but... And that probably helps. But, you know, you watch her and you go, oh, wow. And I bet you could do that as well and in that way tomorrow night or in half an hour if I asked you to do it again. Mm. I'd love to have that ability. I'd love to have Hilsey's gift for accents. I can't do accents. All my ac all my characters sound exactly like me. You know, like I, I have a terrible physicality. My body language is terrible. Like I, 
often and don't look anywhere in the right direction. I will fold my arms on stage, which is classic negative body. La- like, you know, I, but I, I like to think that hopefully it's all those things that also then influence the other things that you do. You can almost have, you don't want it to be like the Expendables or, you know, the, the final battle scene from Avengers Endgame where you're like, oh, you can actually just have like a third of these characters and they could all have better fight scenes rather than trying to jam in, mm. you know, everything that these people can do. Yeah. But yes, there are obviously, like, you know, I love the way that, you know, Mitch Hedberg and Stephen Wright could write one-liners. I love the way that, you know, Hannah Gadsby can, you know, do this incredible social commentary. I like the way that Zoe coombs Ma can, you know, take, you know, one-dimensional ideas, things that I would only present as spoken word and turn them into these three-dimensional, four-dimensional, you know, extrapolations on the nature of comedy that looks back in of it, you know, back on itself. I love that the way that, you know, Nath Belvo and Husey can look at everyday things and turn them into such, you know, original observations. I love the way that Justin Hamilton can, you know, write these complex theatre shows that are kind of partly comedy but partly art and partly you know, kind of pastiche, you know, playing tribute to other things. I, you know, I love the, you know, the the way that Sam Simmons can laugh, make me laugh at things that I couldn't imagine were funny. If you wrote them down on On paper, paper, you know, I never would have imagined that those things were funny. I love the fact that Dylan Moran essentially does, who's my favourite comedian, but it's just... It's, for him, it's the use of language. If I could use language in the way that Dylan Moran, like his use of analogy, his use of metaphor, the way that he has control of taking an ordinary everyday thing and then you know, elevating it with you know, the, the musicality of the language that he uses, you know, I would love to have you know, the, the sharpness and the, you know, the thick skin of Joan Rivers. I would, you know, I'd love to, you know, like, you know, have that kind of ballsy cut through of Ali Wong. Like there's, you know, I'd love to have that unrelentless confidence of youth that Daniel Sloss has that is proper relentless confidence, not not unearned relentless confidence. It's important relentless confidence. You know, I look at all these comedians and think they would all be great skills to have, but but I think if you even define them by that one thing Mm. that is being very unfair to Daniel Sloss and it's being very unfair to Maria Bamford to go hey I'd love to go to do voices like Maria Bamford does Mm. but Maria Bamford's act's not good because she can do great voices Maria Bamford's act's great because she's an incredible writer and she's actually a very compelling performer for someone who's incredibly nervous on stage and you know she talks about very emotional emotionally fragile things and she has a bravery about her work and her her subject matters. And, like, it's all those things that make her a great comic. So even taking her best strength from her wouldn't... It's almost being unfair to her also. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it has me thinking, like, what is your, let's call it, philosophy for comedy? What's your process? You know, we were speaking before about how... You know, we were, I was setting up my tea and all that, and you're like, I, I need to get in front of this um, content. I need to get this thing um, down pat. And I was thinking, like, you, you've got all this stuff. Like, you, you're doing Gruen, you're doing podcasting, you were doing radio, you're doing live shows, three this year. How do you... You must have some form of process. Like, you know, you, you went out last night and practised some content. How Are you writing quite regularly What's oh well i'm uh, sorry the, i of course i must have some sort of process yeah but my process is all sorts of process like okay my entire life is you know essentially because i don't have another job right and this is why yeah. we, i was laughing you know at the start when you said comedian because we'd had a conversation beforehand <laughs> about the fact that i consider myself to be a comedian and there are plenty of people who don't. I've read my emails. But <laughs> I consider myself to be a comedian. And then whether it be radio or writing or, you know, um, podcasting or whatever, they're all just different places that I do comedy. What I do is comedy. And so 
Most of those things involve writing or researching or reading or whatever, but I don't necessarily sit down and go, this is the bit that involves writing or researching. My day is just I get up, I read the newspapers like I always do, or now, not, not newspapers anymore, but I read online, I have a think about the day, sometimes I'll do some writing, sometimes I won't do some writing, sometimes I have something specific that I have to do. Um, how do I write a show? I don't know. I write a show in all the different ways you write a show. Some of it I improvise live on stage and then just work out on stage. Some of it I sit down and go, I want to write a routine about this and I write some jokes and then I try some jokes. Sometimes I am cleaning the pool and like an idea comes into my head and I go away and I write it down. I have notebooks full of notes. I have the phones full of notes. It doesn't matter if I write it down. It doesn't matter if I record it into my phone. It doesn't matter if um, sometimes it's about I need 10,000 words and I write 50 and I edit to 10 or sometimes it's I need 600 and I write 400 and I think I'll extrapolate the rest, you know, on mm. stage as we go. The, the, my method is getting it done. It needs to get done. That's my method. I don't care how it gets done. Mm. What I know is it will get done through a combination of all these things. So if I do the, all those things, it'll get done. Yeah. Which one is more important, sitting down and writing or improvising on stage? N none of them are more important. Each of them add different things. Sitting down and writing can help you structure something. Uh, you know, sometimes you need research and facts behind something, so that's good for sitting down and writing. But sometimes on stage, you can your brain will access a thought that you could never access sitting down and writing. Mm. Um, but if you relied on coming up with everything on stage, apart from when I'm doing my improv show, which is exactly what I'm doing, you, that's essentially just inviting an audience to watch you write for 70 minutes because that's what I'm doing, right? Yeah. You just get to see me write. You get to see me talk to somebody, be inspired by something, and then you get to see how my brain works and how I write. Now, whether I'm sitting in front of a computer or standing in front of a microphone or um, going for a walk or sitting down at a computer, it's, to me, that's all the same. It's all process. Yeah, it's just rep repetition in many formats, whether it's audio, visual, written, whatever it may be. It's getting that permanently in your head so that it, it's there, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, for me, because my entire life is, you know, external to my, um, you know, private life, but my entire professional life is, you know, trying to create comedy in various different ways, um, that's all I really, I mean, also I've been doing it a very long time. Yeah. So it's harder for me to see what I'm doing. I asked Steve Waugh once, you know, the Australian cricket captain at the time, or he might have just retired, but I think he might have still been the cricket captain at the time. And I asked him about facing the West Indian bowlers. I said, how at 90 miles an hour, you know, over 22 yards, um, do you have time to decide what shot you're going to play? And he said, well, you don't really. He said, you train. He said, you train and you train and you train and you train and you have years of experience and you hope that in that moment that your training will take over and you'll be able to make that split second you know, decision. Yeah. But if you, if you needed to think about what decision to make, the ball's already gone past you by the time you've thought about it. And it's a bit like that with comedy, mm. is that you hope that you put in all the work and you're not sure exactly what bit of it. I could be reading something today or tomorrow you know, I talk about filling up the bucket. It's hard to okay. it's hard to do comedy when your bucket's empty. So if more's going out than's coming in, <laughs> you're in trouble. Yeah. So if you're constant it's when comedians end up, you know, doing routines about shit that have yeah, the Uber and I've got plenty of these and you you know it's when you're only doing comedy, your routines end up being about the Uber, the airport, the aeroplane, you know, the things that you're seeing all the time, but you've got enough you're not getting other things into your world and into your life yeah. to have something unique to talk about. So fill up the bucket constantly. You've got to be bringing in information, you know, whatever it is, you know, news, life observations, whatever your Experience. experiences, you know, whatever it is, fill up the bucket. But the, the horrible trick is you never know exactly what you're going to need and when. So, mm. Sometimes a thing that you read two years ago or three years ago or a joke you half wrote ten years ago, will you'll be like, ah, now that. Yeah. Like I did a lot of stuff about climate change in last year's stand-up show. But you did a long time ago as well. 
Oh yeah, well I mean it turns out it's been an issue for a long time. Yeah. Turns <laughs> out <laughs> turns out I was across it. <laughs> Uh, so really, I've this, only just heard about. This always, the last... a, this always annoys me when I'm like, <laughs> it's like marriage equality and like the climate change. I'm like, I've been doing comedy about this shit for twenty years. Yeah, how, yeah. how did I know? <laughs> how did I know? And everybody else didn't know. But but isn't that a barometer for what people think? And merely now, it's just a a narrative in the media. Well, this is exactly kind of what I was talking about before, right? Yeah. About the difference between people and the media and politicians but yeah so anyway my climate change stuff last year was fine but i just didn't feel like i had quite got a handle on where i wanted to be with it and then the the bushfires happened and then suddenly so i wrote all this stuff about the bushfires but then the bushfires happened and suddenly i had a whole new attitude to my climate change stuff as well and so the material just you know I mean, that material, the same, essentially the same jokes, like with a different attitude, is probably 25% funnier now than it was, you know, a year ago. Sometimes it's just about something needing to click, you know? It's, it sounds like what you're doing is basically using system to long-term thinking, which is repetition, repetition, repetition over many different formats, so that, as you said, Steve Wall, when he's lining up for that, that bowl, that it's just it's just a natural process that you have in the moment. Yeah, well, get out of your. I mean, do all the work and then try to get out of your own way. Yeah, which is that is the don't get in your particularly as a comedian. Like, so, yeah. Or let's use the footy analogy, right? Like, you've got to learn all the zones. You've got to learn, you know, where the handball's instinctively meant to go in that situation or Play what's the happening, role. right? <laughs> But if you are still thinking about those things while you're out there, rather than, because once you get out there, you've just got to play and hope that those things you know, come naturally, that you've done all the work and you know that oh, I've got to go for this contest or I've got to not leave my man here, you know, yeah, and then you can actually just play the game, right? But if you're thinking about it too much, you see it, right? Younger players, people who don't quite know yet, they don't know whether I'm meant to go or stay. The minute you're deciding whether you go or stay, it's too late, Yeah, you know? and stand up and, and radio and performing and all those sort of things is a little bit like that. If I'm concentrating on answering your question now, I think that I can answer your question well. But the minute I start having a narrative in my head about am I talking too much or is this yeah. is this correct what I'm saying or, you know, uh, is, is what I've said today consistent in any way? If I'm having those thoughts while, while also trying to talk to you, then I'm not going to be able to give you as good an answer as I would have if I was just in this moment trying to answer it the best that I could. And that's half the battle of being a storyteller slash interviewer in most cases. Like, do you find that when you do your Willosophy interviews that you can sometimes, like I, I would have assumed at the very beginning your way of interviewing, you would have had, I don't know, like I felt like at the very beginning I was way more structured. I would always have things in my head and I'd be in my head more, whereas as time went on I was just, it just became a conversation. Yeah, I certainly, I think, I mean, I have not, I don't listen to my own work. I yeah, I can't stand listening to am it. trying to do it more because I think it probably is important. And I think it's mostly, you know, it's an ego thing, right? Like I don't want to listen to myself. You know, I find it very uncomfortable, but I also would like to get better. And I think that I'm at a stage in my life now where like the, I think early on it might've been damaging, you know, in ways to, listen to myself too much, but now I probably, like I've never seen a full episode of Grown, never seen a full episode of it, and we've been doing it 11 years. Um, but I it think to, me, to make it better, to make things better, you know, there's probably some value in listening back. And so I do it a little bit with my stand-up, and I've got, I just have, have got to the point where I just put myself through the pain of it to, to improve my stand-up, and it has a massive effect on that. But I've never listened back to the early philosophies. But if I could have a guess, because I had no idea what I was doing um, back then or what the podcast was going to be, uh, I bet I talked a lot more early. And I probably definitely felt like I needed to get two things early. Mm. Whereas now, I my attitude to that podcast in particular is just as long as I'm in the moment, as long as I am, I never think about the next question. Because if I'm thinking about the next question, I'm not listening to what they're saying. Yeah. So what I like to do with that podcast is 
just listen to what they say. And I would say 90, 80%, 90% of the time, if I just listen to what they say, the next question become, comes very naturally. But it does mean that occasionally they'll finish an answer and I'll go, oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And then I'll have to think of a question <laughs> yeah. because I haven't been thinking of the question while they're talking. Yeah. I'd prefer that. I'd prefer a little bit of me being awkward and then having to think of something else than me not listening to what that person was saying for the last yeah, 10 seconds because I was trying to think about what I was going to say next. Yeah, and that's what I guess I try to do with as much preparation as possible that in the hope that I'll catch a word in that discussion that will naturally make my brain go, oh, this is the next thing to, to talk about. Um, and I was mentioning storytelling before and, uh, you know, I find it really funny that you said in this interview that you studied this journalism degree and now journal- it's not great to be a journalist these days, whereas you went into comedy, probably the last generation where it was like going off to the circus and now like comedians are stars. Um, so I guess I was curious, like, what, what do you think comedy has up on journalism and telling stories? Well, I mean, truth. Yeah. The capacity to actually say what you think. So you the, know, the we, no bullshit filter. I mean, I don't feel the desire, the desire, need or want to, when I talk about climate change, present the, I mean, sometimes comedically for the sake of it, I'll present the balance, you know, but there is no balance. The science is that climate change is happening. We can have debates over how we, you know, best uh, approach it or, you know, what our targets should be or, you know, like what the race to renewables should be or how we transition out of, you know, economies. But I don't need to hear a balanced argument over climate change because there is no balance. But our media gets you know, sucked into this idea of this false balance narrative, whereas if you get a climate scientist on, you also have to get an idiot on, you know, to present the other case. <laughs> you know, we've got the science on, so we better get a balance, you know, by getting someone who doesn't know anything about science yeah. and see what but they the have to say. But the balanced argument would be just getting another climate scientist. Yeah, in. who believes, you know, just in a different approach or, you know, can yeah. discuss around... You know, we both we both agree that it's happening and this blah blah blah, but we differentiate on this, this moment approach. and this moment. You know, yeah. like yeah, great, let's have that debate. Comedy doesn't need to do that. We don't need to present you know uh, a balanced debate in that way. And I think that a lot of the time the problem is also it's the last bastion of you know free speech in a lot of ways. Um, increasingly trying to be policed, right? Yeah, yeah. Every time you see an article about. Um, you know, a comedian's joke, you know, that's gone wrong or whatever by these multimedia organisations who seem to hold comedians to account more than they do, you know, politicians and themselves. Like, it's them, it's because they're scared. Yeah. You know, powerful people, the one thing they still fear is being laughed at. And that's the one thing that, you know, comedy has over everything else is that, the, you know, it's very hard in this modern-day society where power you know, reinforces power where, you know, elitism reinforces elitism, that the structures within our economy and in our society are for those who are at the top to constantly remain at the top. Send your kids to the right schools, invest in the thing, here's your secret handshake. That's how society operates. The only thing that we can do, you know, to tear down power is really laugh at it, you know, and and it's the one thing that they still can't do anything about. Stop laughing at us. And so that's what's powerful about comedy and it's your show. Like, I often say to people, to new comedians just as a bit of advice, you know, because what will throw a new comedian often is they'll forget a line or whatever and then they'll get flustered by that. And I say to them, your show is from when you start talking to when you stop talking. That's the only thing you've promised the audience. You know, well, hopefully that will be funny, but it's not like if I want to go out one night and talk about, you know, uh, one thing and then go out the next night and talk about something else, that is totally my right and my prerogative and, you know, there's – very few places where you can still do that. So that's what's great about comedy. But as an industry, you know, journalism has, you know, like, yeah, I was at that point where joining comedy was not what it is today where people no. go, I'll get a breakfast radio job or a TV job or, you know, the, the various, you know, jobs that are all in comedy now. It's a huge industry. There's probably 500 open micers, you know, in Australia at the moment. Mm. Um it wasn't like that when I started. It was journalism was the secure industry and comedy was the the risk. And it's been interesting over my lifetime that, you know, it's, it's flipped completely the other way. I think particularly in the last 10 years. I think with the advent of social media, it's mm. really changed that. Yeah. Um, 
and and it's funny you mention uh, truth because that nature of truth is like a thing that you've spoken about a few times, and I can see where that flip from being someone who was at the press gallery to being quite cynical, that uh, the real gravitas for you would have just been the truthful element yeah. of I mean, comedy. And- I thought that I was promised the idea that journalists were the guys who kept the bastards honest. They were the ones who would tell you the truth. Uh-huh. But they're not. They're so often the people who are pursuing the you know, the biases of their media organisations or they're, you know, doing, they're indulging in this both sidesism as if it is somehow, you know, truthful or balanced. And... You know, they have become increasingly, as an industry, uh, afraid of, you know, telling the truth. You know, so, no, I, I mean, I, my major criticism of journalism is that... And it's, it, it, it is hard because there are great journalists out there still doing great yeah. work. Like, but the industry itself, the way that it's set up, even those great journalists are fighting a battle every day to be able to do that as opposed to that being held up as the example of how the industry should operate. Mm. You've been in media for a bit, with, with Gruen in particular. Um, I'd always thought, like, why, why did you never create a sort of anti-agency with all this? I know you, you're disdained for advertising, but you're fascinated by it. You got all these topics. Not that fascinated, but I, <laughs> I've become professionally fascinated by advertising, but I'm not particularly. But tell me, go on. But I, like, then I realised when I was writing about this in my notes, like, really, that's what Will is, like, because he's calling out a lot of these truthful things. The you know the hosting of Gruen and using that as a platform to do that was that avenue. Well, that's what it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, at its best, I think that's what it is. It gives people the tools to understand advertising. And um, that was, you know, Andrew and John's original, you know, raison d'etre for the show, which was, you know, give people the tools to understand advertising in the way that Frontline gave people the tools to understand current affairs shows. Unfortunately, I think a little like Frontline, often having the tools isn't enough, right? Frontline didn't stop current affairs shows being like that. And, you know, Gruen hasn't stopped advertising doing the worst things that advertising does. And mm. on our very best day, we point them out and perhaps give people a little more information about you know, how they're being manipulated. But we are a very small fish in a big pond when it comes to fighting that battle. And, and sometimes, you know, there would be a great desire to be more strident about my criticism of advertising because I do have broader societal criticisms of advertising. Um, but we think that the best way to do it is to do a show where you know, it's through, you know, having the experts on to speak to this themselves. And, you know, you can be critical up to a point of advertising in that regard. The show has a natri- naturally critical, um, you know, perspective. It starts pretty cynically in our first meeting. But, of course, by the time it broadens out to the show, we've realised we get more insights, you know, with a bit more honey than we do often with, you know, if you present someone with the, your shit and this is shit, defend it. You, all you get is a defence, you know, a wall, yeah. whereas if you can... Oh, cognitive dissonance or yeah, hit straight away. If you can get someone to explain a bit of how it works or why it works and how we pick things apart, our hope is that along that journey they actually reveal more, you know, through offering some kindness and some fun you get more of a... But I don't know. Like, and I often am haunted by that thought of, like, you know, if somebody, I used to have a joke about it, but I was like, you know, if somebody would come up to me and say, you know, I'm in advertising and marketing because I love Gruen. And I was like, well, you have you know, missed the point of that show. You know, that's like watching Breaking Bad and, you know, deciding to make meth. It's not really what I was going for. But I think there probably is those people. You know, there's some people who love Gruen because they're in advertising and marketing and love advertising and marketing. I don't. Yeah. And it's often confusing for people when they ask me, to do something outside. In fact, it had happened just today. Burger King have just done a new campaign and a whole bunch of radio stations wanted me to come on and talk about this campaign. I was like, I don't, I do Gruen, but I am not interested in advertising and there are eight months of the year where I try to avoid advertising as much as I can. I think it has a corrosive effect on our society. I think most of the major issues that, the things we've talked about, about journalism and politics and the climate, a lot of them at the end of the day come down to advertising. The climate yeah. is because of our massive consumerist focus. You know, we can't ever fully 
treat what, what's happening with climate change and until we treat the idea that we live in a society where we're constantly told to buy new things and throw away old things and that you need something new and that constantly you need to grow. That is yeah. what's led us to this point right now where we are in this ecological you know, climate disaster. Our politics have been influenced by advertising because, you know, in America to run these big, you know, campaigns, they need billions of dollars, which means to run advertising, right? So that has corrupted the system over there. Um, you, They elected the biggest uh, brand in the world, like the guy who puts his name on his buildings, Trump. That's This is a result of advertising and marketing, what has happened in world politics. The fact that we don't have proper politics anymore, we have market-tested slogans and ideas. This is all because of advertising and marketing and journalism, of course, has been ultimately corrupted by advertising and marketing because the mining companies and fossil fuel companies and all this, they are the people who run the ads in the media and the reason that the media can't cover these stories properly. So at the very heart of it, most of the problems that we have in our society can be traced back to advertising and marketing. So sometimes when I'm on that show and making fun of an ad, I'm like, I'm doing nowhere near enough, but at the same time, I'm about the only person doing anything. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> well, I'm going to cut myself a little break on that. It's so funny you yeah. said that because, like, Carlin used to have, George Carlin used to have this quote about how advertising is the, the very center or gravity uh, of bullshit. Mm. Like, it's the, the where politics, uh, business, uh, and a bunch of other things meet, and it's just it's one it's easily one of his funniest bits. It's where um, advertising is where fake news started, mm. right? Because that's where fake news started. The idea that this thing would cure your baldness or get rid of your acne, or you know, was at this you know we had this you know, Institute of Scienceology that you know you know the Pons Institute where people were working. that's all that's fake news. And that language of fake news came to us from advertising in the first place and then crossed over into the broader media and is the thing that is ruining discourse in our modern day society. Mm -hmm. It all eventually comes back to advertising. Advertising and brands and big corporations who are controlling messages around how we live in our society, right? It all starts with advertising. So have I done enough on Gruen over the years to highlight that? I don't know. Maybe not. I'm often haunted by the idea that we, we don't do enough to pick it apart. But I, we, we do try our best. Mm. Now, talking about, uh, I want to get into some rapid fire questions to finish us off, but I've, I've got to ask, you know, you've at this stage now where you've paired back from radio. Uh, we're talking about George Cullen. So uh, bless his soul, he's not no longer with us. One of, easily one of my favourite comedians, but he's got me thinking about legacy how, I know you like being known for the projects that you're involved in and not being famous per se, but, you know, in 20, 30 years from now, how do you want to be known or remembered? Well, I, the projects, I hope, they, yeah, that it would be nice if people, and, you know, sometimes it happens now and it is the thing that I you know, find nice, which is people go, hey, I really loved that show you did with Adam Spencer on the radio. Yeah. Or, hey, I used to really love The Glass House. I used to sit up and watch The Glass <laughs> House every week, you know. Um, certainly, you know, I mean, obviously the reason we've been doing Gruen for 12 years is because, you know, that's been a you know, popular show that people liked. I, you know, you find it with the podcast, you know, there'll be people who are like, that's what I would like. I would like there to be a whole bunch of people going, you know, I, I, I love the person who comes and... There's one person in particular, there may be more than one, but there's one in particular who's seen every single show that I've done at the Melbourne Comedy Festival, as in like all 24 shows. Um, I mean, I don't care too much about being remembered because I'll be dead and I'm very much... A, yeah, you won't know. I'm very much a, um, a believer in, you know, I'll be dead and I won't care. And however people want to remember me or not remember me is completely up to them. And I think also I quite like anonymity so in, in some ways you know when it's done you know whenever it's done I'd be happy f to be forgotten immediately mm. you know I don't actually have any particular desire to I've forgotten a lot of stuff that I've done you know I I don't hold on to these things or define myself by what it is that I've done but I but the idea that I have made a few things along the way that people have had like, I'm lucky that I think I could probably list five or six things 
external to my stand up that people not it's not like everybody will like all of them but i know that there are you know people who are lifelong fans of the triple j show or people who are you know lifelong fans of the podcast or what you know like you know this mm. and the fact that you've made one thing that somebody likes that much is nice the fact that i've done i've been lucky enough to do sort of four five six of those things external to my stand up which is my real thing that i do um, is you know is is lovely but but I don't... It makes I don't, you happy now. You don't really yeah. care. No, I would like to... My big thing is that I would love to... And this is why I've really made this decision to refocus a bit on on stand-up is that I had a, a look at my life and I was a bit less like... I don't really... You know, the radio is... It's a very prestigious job. Pays you a lot of money, all these sort of things. You know, opens a lot of doors for you. But those things were just not things that I was particularly interested in. What I like doing is doing stand-up and making my own little projects. And so I would love to be able to do stand-up for the rest of my life and, yeah, have the capacity to work on my little projects. You know, so you need them all to be successful enough that you don't, that you can. Yeah. So that's really what I need. If all these things could continue to be successful enough that I could just keep doing them, that I would be very happy with what I'm doing now and that that's enough, you know. Well if you're if you're forty now and for whatever reason I know you don't have the heart issues that Carlin had, if you cark it around the same age that he did, I think it was like sixty three or something, you've got a solid twenty years ahead of you of stand up. Well, I mean but again, like you said, who knows when people when people die. But yeah, I would like to think that I had enough I would love to be able to do I'm forty six years old. Mm-hmm. Um you could be in your greatest, you could be heading for your greatest right. year of life. I think so. I think that that's a legitimate thing. Yeah. And I look at the great stand-ups and many of the great stand-ups that I love. I mean, Carlin really didn't start doing the sort of stuff that he is famous for until he was my age. You know, you look at Seinfeld and, you know, Louis Ricky Gervais, all those, like, I mean, again, like, Louis probably not a great name yeah. to mention these days, but as a comedian, you know, they started doing their most interesting work when they were sort of mid-40s. And that makes a lot of sense to me because mid-40s seems like, you know, say your audience is going to be, and my audience is, you know, 15 to 70, right? In your 40s, you're kind of midpoint. Mm. You know, you've, you haven't forgotten what it's like to be young completely, but you also understand what it's like to be older. You know, there's... Yeah. there's that moment where you can probably connect with equally with like most of your audience. So as a creative artist, being able to connect with that wider range of people probably makes your work, you know, more multifaceted and more interesting. So no, I don't think there's any reason that the next, I mean, I hope the next 20 shows are the best 20 shows that have ever done. That's, yeah, that's the aim of it. Part of the reason that I wanted to do for the Melbourne Comedy Festival this year, I'm doing, Two weeks of my old show were legal because that's my most requested show. And I've never done a return season. I've only ever toured a show. I've never gone back to a place with a show. And I was like, well, I should do that because I was running it in the first time I did it in Melbourne. Now I want to go back and actually do the show that is the end result show. That'll be a new challenge because I've never done that before. And then... I'm doing my improvised shows. So that's 10 completely different shows, like made up on the spot, every night completely different. And that was about challenging me. So if you're going to do the next 20 years, how do you kickstart the next 20 years being not a glide into retirement, coasting on your best stuff being 10 years ago, but how at 46 are you doing something that is the most creatively exciting and challenging thing that you've done so far? Like the idea of walking out at the comedy theatre for 10 nights in a row, you know, that place holds a 1,000 people. Now, it's not going to be full every night, but yeah. you know, I could be walking out to a 1,000 people at the Comedy Theatre with no idea what I am going to say every night for 10 nights. Like, that's, <laughs> as a creative person, incredibly exciting. I mean, terrifying, but exciting all at once. And I want to get better at being an honest performer. Like, and the best way that you can be honest is to take away the structure and artifice. I don't have time to reframe an idea when I'm improvising. You get to hear so much more about what naturally goes on in my head because 
often what goes on in my head, I can then restructure and you know, take out bits and change bits and whatever. So by the time I present it to an audience as an idea, it's been, it's still a few steps away from originally what my thought was. But when you're doing the stand-up show, you, the improvised show, you can't do that. And so even for my future written work to get better, I think there is going to be a series of things I learn out of doing these improvised shows that will hopefully kickstart that up yeah. to a different level. So when I come back in 2021 with a new written show, I'm hoping that it'll be sort of turbocharged ahead from having done these improvised shows. So it's all part of the reason that I'm doing all this stuff is because I really looked at the next 20 years and said, what do you want to do? And what I really wanted to do was do stand up. And I realized that if I was going to do stand up for the next 20 years, I needed to continue to keep getting better at stand up. And the best way to get better at doing stand up is to take risks. Well, this reminds me of Andrew Schultz, who's one of my favorite comedians, and he literally just does an improv show on top of his standard special or whatever yeah. it was. He actually did an improv special, yeah. which I found like that's fucking amazing. Like, completely improv, just records it, and that became a special that I think he produced but was then sold to Netflix or something like that, which I just find crazy. Um, anyway. We've got to jump into these rapid fire questions. Okay. So, fast answers. Yes. Uh, if you had to gift a book to the audience for Christmas, what would it be and why? Um, uh, Good Omens, Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett. It's okay. one, of, one of the all time great books. It's just a, it's just a perfect book. Two of the greatest, you know, fantasy comedy writers of all time, collaborating on something. It's just a, it's just a brilliant. It's the book that I've read the most. It's the one that I, you know, tend to give to people. Um, My brother's yeah. just started on Neil Gaiman. Yeah, so. but both great authors. And what that's the other thing about Good Omens is that it then it opens you up to a world of exploring all the great work that Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman have done in various different ways. These are meant to be short answers. Stop, it. <laughs> Stop talking. Um, what frustrates you that society is not able to find middle ground on? Uh, I mean, I, I would argue that it's our constant search for middle ground that frustrates me. I'm not sure that middle ground is, should be necessarily what we are looking for in our society. In fact, I think that we have fallen into the trap of thinking that the middle way is the way. But what happens is that in most issues, there is one side of the issue that isn't playing fair, right? Right. So, you know, we talk about middle ground between two thoughts, right? Um, and this side will be like playing fair over here. So the middle ground should be here and this side be here. But this side just keeps moving closer and closer and closer over here. And then we're just like, well, well, to be middle ground, we need to put it over here in the middle. But hang on, that was actually way yeah. over here compared to where the middle originally was. So I find that, in fact, I would say that, you know, the biggest, you know, probably thing that's going to, you know, possibly lead to the destruction of you know, humanity on this planet is has been the desire to find middle ground around, you know, climate science where there is no middle ground. It has been, you know, scientists telling us what the facts are and then it has been people being paid by the fossil fuel companies who have been, you know, putting this information out for nearly 30 or 40 years, much like the cigarette companies did around, you know, tobacco. That's it, and it has been then the media's desire to find middle ground between people who are outright lying and people who are telling the truth that has led to, you know, the horrible situation that we're in now. Mm. Yeah, may, maybe the question should be reframed from, uh, I don't know whether it's mean or median, but whatever is closest to the true answer. Right. Um, last question for you. Uh, what's in the fridge at home? Oh, um, uh, lots of stuff. I always have a pretty full fridge, although I'm trying to, um, one of the big things that I'm trying to do is not waste food. So we're going to move to the country and um, one of the things that we're really keen on is the idea of um, nothing ever leaving the the property. Uh -huh. You know, so you should be able to, you know, like set it up, you know, with compost and, you know, so all these sort of things. Of sorts. Yeah, having that sense of, you know, that, you know, having, we've got rainwater tanks and whatever that, the property itself, you know, is in a lot of ways self-sustainable, but also that you're not, you know, 
you know, creating waste. You've got systems, you know, there to, you know, dispose of the waste or reincorporate the waste back into the earth or, you know, naturally fertilise and enrich, those sort of things. But the thing that I'm probably can be guilty of in the city is um, I fresh food gets thrown out more often than I would like. So what I would like to do is just get... I, I'm making a real effort to just buy stuff that I know that I'm going to use as opposed to... Um, so, but there's like always, that day or for the next two days? Well, or... just not buying speculative things. <laughs> like, I'm just going, I might, I'm, you know, if I'm going, like... So, for example, I'm like... Tin uh, yeah, beans on sale, let's buy 20 of them. Well, that's okay <laughs> because that, you don't have to throw out tin beans, right? You know, no, I, it's, it, it would always be fresh food for me. Yeah. So it will be me over shopping at the markets, you know, going... Uh, yeah, I'm oh, gonna, maybe I'll have yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll have this, maybe I'll have this. And then like three days later, you're like, well, didn't get to that silver beat, you know. So um, uh, I tend to, because uh, I cook the dog's fresh food. So a lot of the spare vegetables go into the dog's food when I cook that anyway. That's um, good. So you give them like uh, raw food or actual food as opposed to like kibble. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, um, so I make them food. Um, so there's always veggies, lots of fresh veggies. And I'm vegetarian anyway, so just lots of fresh veggies in the house. There's always a range of condiments. I'm a big condiment person. Like I like sauces and, and my, you know, my girlfriend jokes that I can't go to a market without buying a jar of, you know, some, you know, some paste or concoction that somebody's flogging in, which is absolutely true. I do like a, I like a condiment. Uh, there is always, um, whatever would there be? We're, we're a kind of, there will always be some sort of hippie drink. So there'll be some like kombucha or some sort of like, you know, whatever the latest, <laughs> you know, kind of hippie soft drink uh, would be. Much, um, much oat milk? Uh, no, we do, uh, parents are dairy farmers, so we do dairy. Okay. Um, can't, can't let them down. But I, I prefer dairy milk anyway. So dairy milk, uh, cheese, we still eat cheese and all those sort of things. So who's, who's your brand of choice? Uh, for dairy milk, yeah, Devondale, because that's the one that my brother's yeah. milk goes to. I saw so, Ross's uh, yeah. ad from twenty four. Exactly, <laughs> I have to be, I have to be loyal. Um, so, uh, Lurpak butter, though, I do oh, like that. Shit. So it's delicious. Um, so yeah. there's always like probably three tubs of butter in the fridge because I love butter. Um, there would be a standard yogurt. There's always yogurt. So yogurt, butter, cheese, that's your kind of dairy stuff, milk, and then a lot of veggies, and then all the meat that would be in the fridge is for the dogs. So there'd be chicken and or dogs and the cat. Um, so there's always probably some beef strips and some uh, some chicken and stuff in the fridge that for the the dogs and the and the and the cat. And then uh, that's pretty. That'd be pretty. That's your pretty much your standard. Yeah. Standard yeah, fruit trust. You're probably eating like I'm guessing with the name Anderson. You probably got family from Northern England. Um, maybe some Scandinavian in there. It's sort of similar to my mum's side of the family, dad's side of the family. They're from an island uh, in the Mediterranean in Greece, right. and so I find like eating more and more like your ancestors probably would have is uh, is really good. I stopped eating beef about. I'll have it occasionally, but like 18 months or so ago. And it was actually the time I found out that um, I was not good with processing saturated fat. It actually yeah, would spike right. my blood glucose, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. It's a rare abnormality that some people get. And um, the more I ate like a Mediterranean, the more um, just the weight just came off. I lost a lot of weight. I felt a lot lighter, healthier. I would like to eat less bread. That yeah. would be if I could cut back on something that I know makes me a bit sluggish and I know kind of makes me a bit heavy, it's bread, but I, I do find I, it hard I do not really to, like like brown bread, bread, but the problem is that um, I have IBS and you're not meant to have too much brown bread because it's got fructan in it. Uh -huh. So I can be ripping like these amazing farts and Lauren's just, like, <laughs> just, just enough with the bread, please. So I'm like, oh, I can have it, I have it like one or two days a week now. That's like my cheat, cheat day. <laughs> um, Will, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Where can people find you on the uh, interwebs? Uh, I always say, I mean, I have a website, but it's so rarely updated. I'm terrible at it. So um, comedy.com.au is the place where okay. um, all the links to my shows are. 
and then just find me in the places where you already are. So like, that's what I say to people. Like, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and the podcasts all have their own, you know, pages and various things. But yeah, just, I mean, people find me. I'm the only Will Anderson with one L. I'm the most, I'm certainly the most well-known one. So if you Google my name and whatever you need to know, it will probably be me that It'll comes be up. Yeah, yeah I, 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 at the moment I'm finding Instagram is probably the only platform I'm using because um, I find it the least negative of all platforms and I've sort of cut most things out. I'm not a huge social media person. Mm, I, I yeah. like People would think that's not true because I am on them a bit, but I really... I don't engage in it a lot. Yeah. A lot of the time it's just me plugging my shows or I use Twitter a lot for just seeing what other people are thinking about what's going on, but I don't really engage much. And if yeah. you're going to send me a message or anything like that, I may eventually get back to it because sometimes luck. I do, but don't, <laughs> if it's urgent, don't, don't expect that I'm actually going to read it because it might be months before I get to it. Yeah, I would second that. Um, <laughs> 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 Thanks so much for coming in. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching Uncommon and this week's episode. If you like it, smash that like button. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, please do subscribe. We would love that. We'd love to build this audience that we're growing here of Uncommoners. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with audio, you can search for us on all of your good podcast apps. It's Uncommon or Uncommon Show will typically find us. For social, you want to see behind the scenes this amazing studio that I'm sitting in, just search at Uncommon underscore show uh, and everything will be there, including our weekly promos. But um, look, thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, thanks for watching.